So good evening, I'm, I'm Johnny Horchek. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons uh, that works out of St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital. Um, I've been doing this for a long, long time. The, um, I did a training, uh, let's see. So back in my younger days, uh, I thought the older athlete was the 35 year old weekend warrior, but now that I'm 30 years past that, um, I've slid that definition a little bit further up here. So my background is I had 28 years in the Army. Um, I did the fellowship at West Point. I was there for 12 years taking care of the uh, cadets. Uh, after I got out of the Army, I've been working in this area since uh, 2003 with orthopedic and sports medicine. I joined Crystal Run about two years ago. Uh, in the interim, I also took care of uh, Marist College, so I've had a lot of experience uh, taking care of sports-related injuries from the young athlete to the uh, older athletes. Um, as a side note, my first lecture at um, St. Luke's here was two years ago on Saturday, or I mean, in 2003 on Saturday, it was the anniversary of Black Hawk Down. Uh, where I was one of the participants taking care of the people that were wounded there. Just a little bit of what I did in the military and then some research awards, um, continued to be active in practice and, and try to publish and move medicine ahead. I was 48 when I got my combat medic badge supporting a ranger company outside of Gardez in Afghanistan. So let's talk about, we're going to talk about meniscal function and uh, the anatomy. And <clears throat> there's been some exciting changes in the way we approach menisci, but there's also been some limitations just based on the function of what the anatomy does. So we're going to spend a lot of time going over the anatomy, the blood supply, and what the meniscus does, because that predicts what we can and can't do in helping treat meniscal tears. And I know we've all had friends that have had meniscal tears or we've had kids or grandkids that have had meniscal tears. Um, so let's move it ahead into the uh, slides. So this is what the menisci are, those little crescents. So this is the lateral, it has a lot more motion than the medial side. These are white things here, the uh, cruciate ligaments there. And what does the meniscus do? It acts as a shock absorber and it helps cushion the knee and cushion the cartilage and redistribute the load um, across the knee joint. And you can see in the slide there where it's sort of filling in where the curves are on either side of the um, femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. It also helps distribute the lubricating fluid because the articular cartilage doesn't have a blood supply. It's nourished by diffusion only. So as we talked about, it transfers load. It's a shock absorber. It's a stress reducer for the knee joint. It does give some secondary stabilization. If we go back one slide, you see how the meniscus sort of looks like chalk blocks. So it does prevent some anterior and posterior translation, but that's not its main function. That's a secondary function. This is kind of an important slide because I'll be referring back to it. Um, so the important, the important parts here is that there's circumferential collagen fibers that go around and that helps distribute the, the stress loads in the meniscus. Think of these fibers like the uh, hoops on a barrel. If you cut the hoops on a barrel, the barrel just falls apart. And that's what happens to our meniscus is it basically falls apart, it starts spreading out. And so it can't absorb that load and the load gets transmitted to our cartilage. Our cartilage wears down faster than normal. So there's some other special structures that sort of tie it together like rebar, okay, to help reinforce this. But as you can see, thick on the outside, tapers to nothing. Uh, with these circumferential bands. And these circumferential bands, if, if they're broken, we really, really have a problem. 
here's another description, and we're getting into some of the other important considerations. Where'd my pointer go? Is that at the outer edge, the blood supply only comes in. Now this is about five millimeters, and that's really important in helping us make determinations as to what we can do in the future. Hang on, I gotta admit somebody. There we go. And then you get into the chondrocytes and then there's just the superficial cell layer here. So this is really where the healing potential is limited to. Again, here's another description, a little more vivid. You can see that it's right along the edge where the blood supply comes in. This is an avascular zone and the potential for healing is almost non-existent there. This is, some, uh, this is a picture from Steve Arnosky's work. Um, he was one of the first ones to define this with a dye injection technique years ago. And you can see, again, how we divide it into three zones. This is the red-red zone, the red-white zone, and then just the white zone. Uh, you can see poor healing, okay healing, really good where the vascular supply is against the edge. Again, just another representation to, so that you, you understand when we're seeing some of the other pictures, why we can fix it and why some of them we can't. So looking, this is how the stresses are distributed when you start walking. You can see that the pressure down here is trying to push the meniscus out, but because of these circumferential fibers, they're tending to keep this pulled back in to keep that load um, shared across the joint surface so you don't have a point focal contact area. And here's a good demonstration. And here's the part that is really what happens when we have a meniscal tear, um, even a 10% loss of the meniscus equals about a 15 to 20% increased load transmission across the joint. So I, a lot of times I use uh, the example of tires on your car, they're wearing down every day. Um, when you move, lose part of your meniscus, it's sort of like they go out around and they start wearing a little bit faster. So again, here's a, where you see a tear, this starts extruding out and you see there's nothing cushioning in this area here. So meniscal tears are pretty common injuries. They're 12 to 14% of um, presentation involving the knee. Uh, it changes the contract pressure and leads to earlier osteoarthritis. We know from NFL data that what they call the combine data where they screen all the players and they keep a tremendous amount of data. Um, if a player loses a, a down lineman, if he has a partial lateral meniscectomy, his arthritic changes progress to where he's pretty much done in five years. If he has a medial meniscal tear and has partial meniscectomy, he's done in seven years. So we clearly know that there's a progression if you continue to do high demand activity. So these are the kind of tears we see sort of a little intrasubstance tear, the flat tear, these complex tears. And you can see how like the flat tear and this complex tear are gonna give people symptoms of catching, buckling, giving way, because that's gonna flip back and forth. And sometimes it'll flip and it'll be okay for a couple days and then you bend or twist and it flips back and it really is bothering and annoying. So that's part of, that we listen to as part of the history. Um, these horizontal tears down here, again, can give you that catching sensation. The bucket handle can literally, this gets big enough to where this actually flips on itself and that can lock the knee and prevent it from coming out. Those you gotta do something a little bit sooner and be a little more aggressive in. Here's just a description in three, sort of a three-dimensional picture so you can see, and you can see how this bucket sometimes will flip back to where it was, or it'll flip out and you cause your knee to lock and you gotta really wiggle it to try to get it undone. So diagnosing and treating meniscal tears. History is a very good um, 
you know, if you listen to the history, it gives you a really good idea as to what's going on. Uh, then we do the physical exam, and then we do the appropriate imaging. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of people come in and say, oh, I need an MRI. Uh, a lot of times we don't necessarily need an MRI, and we'll get to that at the, towards the end of the talk. And then we'll go over some treatment options as to what we can do to help you out. So the history, um, a twisting, flexing rotation um, for an acute injury, or it could be just wear and tear. You know, we're up walking, doing things we've done, you know, for a thousand times, and it just finally wears out. The things I listen for and, and you know, the orthopedists look for, is there a, a catching or a locking sensation? Um, do you, can't you fully extend it? Can't you fully flex it? Are you having pain? Um, does it feel like you're going to give way when you're walking? Does it feel like your knee is going to just sort of buckle and you got to reach out and grab something? Or is it just stiff? So what we do is we, we look, see if there's swelling. We try to feel if there's some swelling, put you through a range of motion, and then we do some special tests. So a lot of times if you've had a knee exam, you'll see the examiner sweep their hand down along your thigh towards the top of your kneecap. And the reason we do that is there's a pouch underneath here called the suprapatellar pouch. And what that is, is, is a reflection, a fold of tissue that allows your knee to go through a range of motion. It's sort of like an accordion that slides back and forth uh, to allow us to go through a full range of motion. So you can see this is a pretty big area. So if you have a subtle effusion, um, it can layer out and not look like it. So we actually sweep down, and then with your other hand, you can feel just below where that hand is on the picture, the fluid wave accumulate underneath there, and so you know they have um, fluid. Sometimes it comes in and it's, it's obvious. You know, Both you and the patient can go, oh yeah, you got swelling in there. Um, one of the other subtle signs is you see here the little dimples. When you see the dimples disappear and, and you sweep down, you'll see it really actually start bulging out in that area. So we put people through a range of motion and try to figure out, can they come out fully straight? If they can't come out fully straight, then I've got a high index of suspicion that they have some sort of flap tear or um, a bucket handle tear that's blocking that last little bit to come out fully straight. Uh, this is the McMurray's test where you flex and rotate. Uh, it causes a lot of discomfort if you have a meniscal tear, uh, but it helps in the diagnosis. Palpation along the joint line. So when I'm palpating right along the line of the meniscus, uh, there's usually tenderness there um, <clears throat> when people have meniscal tears. So I've showed you a lot of pictures and described a lot of things. This is what a normal knee looks like. This is what we call the medial compartment. So it's the inner half of the knee. Uh, the knee is one full joint. People go, well, when I inject things, they go, well, how's it going to get around? The knee is one compartment. We divide it into three for description to the medial, lateral, and up underneath the patellofemoral joint. This is the medial compartment. So what we're seeing is this is the femoral condyle, the end of your thigh bone. It's nice and round. This is the tibial plateau, which is relatively flat. It's got a slight concavity to it. And then this is the meniscus. And you can see how the meniscus fills the, this area between where the curb is and stuff. And you see, when I look at a knee, a good, a healthy knee looks white like a cue ball here. This yellow is, is just the way the, the pictures come out, but this is a normal looking knee and we'll show some pictures later on and you'll see the difference. So just try to keep this in your mind. Imaging studies, um, weight bearing radiographs are really important and we'll get to that a little bit later, especially in those of us that are over 50 years old. Um, magnetic resonance imaging, the MRI is, is really good to help detect meniscal tears, but it's not absolutely necessary in the 50 year old and above, and we'll talk about that a little bit. For those that have had prior knee surgery for either a ligament tear and or a meniscal tear and may have 
a tear on the other meniscus or a new tear in the residual that was left um, an arthrogram, because what will happen is even years after um, surgery, there's a signal that's um, picked up. And so it's read as could be a tear, could be not a tear. You have to correlate with the operative report. Where the arthrogram is the dye, it will track into a new tear and definitively tell us what's going on in there. So here's an MRI. <laughs> And you can see on the left, uh, normal meniscus, those black triangle looking things. And again, this is a good representation. You can see how that meniscus fills that gap of where the curve is to distribute the load. And on the left, you can see where the torn meniscus is. That's the ex close to the exact same cut. And so you can see it's not filling that void and it's not going to transmit load back there. This is the view of what we call a coronal view from the front. And so you can see where the arrows are, that bright white signet tells you where there's a tear. So treatments. <clears throat> Does every meniscus need surgery? The bulk of them do, but there's a percentage of them that don't. So non-operative treatment includes oral anti-inflammatories if they're tolerated and you're not on blood thinners, uh, physical therapy, sometimes braces, sometimes even simple knee sleeves, elastic sleeves, give people enough um, support that they can function and do very well. And, and part of the reason we know that non-operative treatment works is we occasionally have people that come in, especially in the over 50 group, that they're symptomatic, they're buckling, they're giving way, their knees swelling. And we get the MRI and we talk about surgery and, and it's, everything's indicated, but then life comes along. Family issue, work issue, and they go, doc, you know what, I'll see you in a couple months, we'll, we'll set up surgery there, I'm gonna just sort of tough it out because I, I just got some really important things in my life. A fair amount of them come back and need surgery, but there's also a high enough percentage to come back and go, hey doc, my knee's fine. And I check them, the clicking's gone, the swelling's gone. They do have a little ache. Sometimes they take Tylenol, sometimes they take an Advil. So we know some of these will settle down, especially what we call the degenerative tears. Surgical intervention, uh, we resect it if it's torn, and you'll see why in, in a little bit, or we try to repair it. Obviously, in the 20, 30-year-old, uh, the tissue quality is better, uh, it can handle sutures, and is likely to repair. And because of the, the alteration of weight bearing and the increased wear and tear, you're gonna try to do everything you can. Um, there's some indications for surgery in those of us that are over 50, and we'll get to that, and that's some of the new exciting things that have come out over the last few years, and have pretty strong literature to support that. So this is what arthroscopy looks like, a couple little stab wounds. We have instruments that can reach in like Pac-Man and just sort of nibble up the tears. So here's a, a, what we call a bucket handle tear or a horizontal tear that was in the what we call red-red zone. And these are the kind of stitches we put in, and this is all done arthroscopically. Uh, sometimes we do a, a, what we call an inside out and make a small incision over the side of the knee and tie the on the outside. Um, the rehab is, is fairly long. Uh, like I said, because the blood supply, even though I showed you where the blood supply is, it takes a long time. We keep people non or partial weight bearing for six weeks, slow their motion for another month or two, and it's really four to six months to go back to do something, 20% uh, correction, 70% of the meniscal tears heal in a young person under 25, 30, um, which means 30% don't heal. But we always try to take the chance um, to get it fixed just because we know the wear and tear will happen if we can't get it fixed. Um, people go back, I've got a, a person that went back to wrestling and wound up uh, winning his state weight class for his weight um, after a meniscal repair. 
but he waited a full year after the repair before he went back. So <clears throat> we can have success with that. Here's another tear, and you can see this is sort of right at the red-white zone. And you see how it looks like it's right here. Let me, where's my pointer again? There we go. So some people would say that looks like that's in the white-white zone. Why are you fixing that? You just told us a little while ago that you really can't fix that. We describe tears, but tears are, are, are not by the picture. This tear probably went down and then it went back. So it's a complex tear. So part of the tear way in the bottom and the back that we don't see was where the blood supply comes in. And we also do some tricks of trephining where we put a needle through to stimulate blood supply to come in there. So again, in a young person, you're gonna take that chance to fix it so he can go back to activity and hopefully prevent arthritic change. Now, this is what we were talking about, and those of us that, you know, have a couple miles on the basketball court, um, it just frays and it just wears out. And obviously, that's not repairable. We just take a biter and a shaver and we clean all that stuff out so that you don't have that loose stuff constantly irritating the joint and creating the swelling, which is the body's natural reaction to stuff irritating the inside of the joint. Again, here you see an, another tear, and you can see we just trim all this out. Now we leave all this. So we basically will take this right along here, all the way back to here, but we leave this. We try to leave as much of the um, meniscus as we can to act as a shock absorber. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, a special one because you may hear it. Um, in your grandkids, uh, or you may have had one younger, it's called a discoid meniscus. Um, and as you can see, here's the normal, and here's the discoid. And the discoid is primarily um, a lateral meniscus um, anatomic variant. So this is a fold where it covers the whole condyle partial and a little bit less partial. Uh, these are um, genetically a little bit more predominant. Uh, we see them in the Asian, pre predominantly more the Japanese Asian population and American Eskimo, and, and that's just the genetics. In the old, old days when I first started, uh, we used to say, we used to think we had to take it out or do what we call the saucerization and literally cut the central point out and try to make it into a try to make it into a meniscus that looked like this. We find that's not true unless if we see them as an incidental finding, if they have a medial meniscus tear and they have a lateral meniscus tear, or I mean a lateral discoid meniscus, we do not do anything with a lateral discoid unless it's torn. If it's torn, then we try to trim it out. And the nice thing about that is most of the time when we trim out the tear, we have what would appear to be a pretty normal lateral meniscus to give them cushioning for the rest of their life. So here you see a partial discoid covering almost the whole condyle. And then there's, there's a small tear in the back and you can see how they're biting it out and doing what we call our saucerization. And it still gives you a pretty good rim. That looks like almost normal meniscus, except it's a little bit thicker. I put this slide back in. We've gone over it a couple times, showing how the meniscus extrudes when it's torn. Um, and that's going to go into, take us into the meniscal root tears. And this is something that was talked about in 92, um, but re up till recently, has been sort of, what do we do with this? We trim it up, try to see what happens. So it comprises, you know, before we said uh, meniscal tears were 14% of all knee injuries, this is seven to 9% of those meniscal tears. Unfortunately, the natural history is over a quarter progressed to total knee replacements within three years of diagnosis. So 
people have become more aggressive in doing meniscal root repairs in an attempt to slow the progression of osteoarthritis. And one of the this year's board review um, questions, um, one of the articles we had to read was on meniscal root repairs, and they were strongly advocating, and, and their literature was pretty good, um, to consider up into 55 um, maybe even a little older if the joint surface is really, really good and there's not a lot of arthritic change to consider a meniscal root repair. <clears throat> so the 10 year results when they looked at, if you did nothing, the 10 year results, 95% went on to osteoarthritis, that's the conservative, um, and 45% had a total knee replacement. Um, if you did a meniscectomy, just trimming it out, 99% went on to arthritis, almost half of them went on to a knee replacement. If you did a repair, you still had a significant um, progression, but it was almost half of what if you did nothing and you cut the total knee replacement um, rate down by almost 20% there. And that's pretty significant in economic terms for people in lifestyle and, and the different things. So I think more of us are looking to, if the conditions are right, to do a meniscal root repair. So what is a meniscal root tear? Hang on, got to admit somebody else here. So it's this tear right here, and here's a diagrammatic type way we fix it. So you can see, if this is torn here, you've completely lost your hoops. And as we showed in those previous slides, when the hoop's gone, that meniscus just spreads out and you get complete weight bearing on the cartilage and no load distribution with the meniscus. So we try to grab this with sutures, pull this back in, put the tension back in the loops, and we do this by drilling some tunnels and there's a couple other techniques, but this is, I think the, the most technically, um, the easiest technically, and it also gives us good results. So here's what a meniscal root tear looks like on the MRI. It's a hard diagnosis. It doesn't have the classic buckling and giving way sometimes. Uh, fair amount of pain, swelling, but the MRI shows this bright signal here. You see on this side, you see the black going all the way up to the edge. So that's where the anchor point is here. You see this anchor point's got this bright white signal right there. And you see there's just bright signal right there. You really don't see the sharp triangle that we would normally expect to see here like we saw in the previous ones. That's what it looks like in actuality. So this edge should be all the way over to here. So you can see there's no tension. And you actually get an idea that you see the capsule, instead of coming straight down, is actually the tension has slid back towards our left. So our root repair is gonna to try to grab this right here and bring this into a bony socket here. So we actually drill a socket so we get bone marrow, which helps with the healing and pull the sutures down and, and pull it right over. We'll see those in a second here. Again, just to reiterate what we were talking about, restoring those hoop strengths. Um, so here's the algorithm, because obviously, uh, you know, the 50 year old and above has got some other issues. So if it's an acute traumatic event, then you look at it, absolute contra, uh, contraindications our subchondral collapse, in other words, we see the bone is crushed down, the joint surface is flattened, um, grade three defects, and, and we'll see a couple pictures later on, um, malalignment. The other part is uh, body mass index of over 30. So if somebody's extremely heavy, um, it's gonna fail. Uh, we, the, the chances of it succeeding are, are very low. So in the chronic, if, if there's no significant pathology, you go back over to here and you look at the contraindications or relative contraindications, and if you can, you try to repair it. So here we see sutures in place. We've got the, and 
I'm going to back up a little bit in saying that the um, part of the reason that we can fix these are increases in uh, technologic capabilities. The instruments that we have now are smaller. The sutures, these sutures are made swaged with a loop, so I can pass a loop through. I don't have to try to tie. I don't have to pass multiple sutures. I can just catch it and loop on itself. And when I put tension, that sucks it right down into that socket that we created. So the, the instrumentation is uh, developed that we can do this, the guide systems, because obviously we have to put a guide from the inside of the knee to this back corner, and it comes all the way out the front here. And, you know, there's a lot of structures there. So you got to, you're drilling pins across the knee and up into the knee joint. And so you got to have very accurate instrumentation to be able to do that, which they have developed. Here's a couple more examples of the, just sort of the technical stuff you're doing to try to get that. And, and you can see the, the diagrammatic, um, what they're doing here. And then in actuality, you see sucked down into the socket that you've created here with bone marrow in there to try to get it to heal. A little bit more of a close up. So <clears throat> we're gonna go on to talk a little bit about arthroscopy and, and those of us that are over 50. Um, we have predictable pain relief for mechanical symptoms. In other words, if somebody comes in and says, look, uh, I take three or four steps and I have to reach out and catch something or my knee's buckling, I've fallen down four or five times because my knee's given away. Those kind of complaints, um, we can predictably improve with arthroscopy. If people come in and go, doc, my knee's killing me. And I, I said, tell me what's going on with your knee. Go, you know, if I sit too long, it hurts. It hurts when I'm sleeping. It hurts when I walk on it. It hurts when I go downstairs. It hurts when I go upstairs. And I, I, I let them try to talk to me and, and I try not to lead them, you know, and, but at some point I'll go, do you have a sense of it giving way or buckling or, you know, and I go, no, it just hurts all the time. And, and unfortunately, a bunch of them, have, people have come in and they've got their MRI and they're focused that somebody said, you got a meniscal tear. Well, in reality, what they really needed is a set of standing radiographs because their symptoms are more likely due to their osteoarthritis than their meniscal tear. So a lot of times we don't need those depending on the standing radiographs. And we'll go over some pictures here. So this is what a normal knee looks like. We've got a good joint space and there's really no space in the body. That space is occupied by the cartilage, which we saw the lining plus the meniscus, that triangular shaped structure right in here to distribute the load. So when somebody comes in and I get this standing x-ray, I don't need an MRI. I, I know what's going on. This is arthritis. It's not going to respond to arthroscopy. It's going to respond to uh, appropriate measures of anti-inflammatory therapy, bracing, cortisone injections, maybe the viscoelastic supplementation. And that's a whole nother discussion uh, because the Academy has withdrawn its recommendations for it. The insurance companies, half of them, aren't paying for it, half of them are. So we're sort of in a dilemma as to what we do. We, you know, we have to tell people that, you know, it may not work as good as it is, um, but if the insurance covers it, I have people come back and swear by it. I have people come back and say, hey doc, you know, you put a cortisone in, you put the gel in, just put a cortisone in, uh, the, the cortisone worked better. And that's why, you know, we've had to sort of temper our, our use of the gel just because the science has not been as strong as we thought it was. So here's the grading scale we use. Um, and as you can see, as it gets flattened, you get the bone spurs. So over here, if you have a meniscal tear in the grade two, and you're having mechanical symptoms going in and arthroscopically cleaning that out, may be beneficial. You know, I, I had a gentleman who was 80 some years old when they opened the World War II Museum 
or wall down in um, Washington. He came in and I was like, you got arthritis, you're not, I'm not gonna do anything. But he had classic buckling, catching, giving way. His joint spaces were preserved. I got in there and I mean, his knee looked really good, better than a lot of 50 year olds I'd seen. And he was able to make it down to go to the opening and it was really grateful for that. So age is not the determinant, it's the physiologic state of your knee. So <clears throat> one of the things that we see, because we see it fairly frequently, is people go to their primary, um, they go someplace, they, they don't have, they get x-rays which are laying down, which a lot of times fails to show the amount of arthritic change, because when you're laying down, the joint sort of opens up. Uh, when you're standing, it collapses back down. Um, they come in with an MRI like this. When I see this, even though you got a tear, I know there's a 50-50 chance I'm not gonna make you better by scoping it and addressing this tear. Because you can see here's the joint surface, you've got a big defect, you're down the bone. And the other key is right here. This is normal bone density, this sort of black gray color. When I start seeing this white coming up from an area where there's cartilage goss, this is subchondral edema. This is the bone reacting to arthritis. And it's at that point, arthroscopy is not gonna help. We need to do the conservative stuff, try to do what we can, get you to where we can till you need your knee replacement. Again, we see the meniscal tear, but the bigger issue is you've got subchondral edema. This is arthritic change on both sides of the knee joint. And you gotta remember, it doesn't look collapsed because this is laying down, it's not weight bearing. So this is, remember that nice picture I showed you before where it looked like a nice cue ball and nice and smooth. So this is a tear, but this is what arthritis looks like. Cobblestoned, irregular, and it's hard to see and it's hard to capture on picture, but when I'm looking through the scope, when I start seeing sort of a yellow translucent coming through the, the nice white, then I know I'm down and seeing raw bone. Just another where you see the tear as well as the arthritis. And again, addressing this tear is not gonna really make much difference here. So pending your questions, I wanna thank you all for participating.